Uh, so thank you for coming out today. Uh, I know March is an incredibly busy time in the craft community. I appreciate you all being here with us. I know I see a few familiar faces in here, but uh, for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Nora Atkinson, and I am the Lloyd Herman Curator of Craft at the Renwick Gallery. I joined Nicholas Bell a year ago. Actually, I am celebrating my one-year anniversary with the Renwick this week. Very exciting. Thank you. So we are the Renwick Curatorial Team. Uh, the other thing that I'm incredibly excited to announce is that, miraculously, uh, the Renwick renovation, many of you know that the Renwick is currently closed, the Renwick renovation is going on schedule, uh, so we are planning to open, come hell or high water, uh, in November of this year. So please mark your calendars, there will be much rejoicing at that point. Um, Let's see, so that brings me to the main question of the afternoon, the morning, I guess, um, which is why are we here and why are we doing this now? Um, of course, the obvious answer on one level is that we wanted to retain a presence in the craft community while the museum was closed. Um, but also, over the last year, as Nicholas and I have been twiddling our thumbs and drinking margaritas with the museum <laughs> closed, um, we've had quite a lot of time to think about this idea about ideals that, that ideals that make the craft museum what it should be in the 21st century. So that's the question that we want to address today. Um, many of you might remember the last major symposium that the Renwick hosted in 2012. Uh, that symposium was called Nation Building. It accompanied Nicholas's show 40 Under 40 Craft Futures. Uh, that symposium opened a dialogue around the topic of what is happening in craft today. It looked at a broad spectrum of craft practice among a new generation of makers, now coming of age, from social activism to performance, to sloppy craft and the do-it-yourself ethos, new materials and processes advancing in the digital age. And it, so it really took the pulse of what's happening in the field as the golden age of the studio craft movement starts to die down and slip into the historical period, and a younger generation of makers embrace the new, more interdisciplinary approach to craft as a language untethered to a certain extent from the five traditional craft media. I think this is an incredibly important and exciting time to be in the craft world. Um, during this shakeup, but at the same time, this kind of interdisciplinary free-for-all does present uh, a real challenge to museum professionals such as myself uh, as we slip into the next uh, phase of the craft museum. So in a nutshell, that's why we're gathered here today. As a natural follow-up to nation building, which asked the question of what, we are here today to talk about the whys and the hows, figure out how we respond to these changes, capturing the vital energy that's going on around us, mirroring and recording this contemporary feel, feeling while paying tribute to the forerunners in the field, to talk about who we should be in the future and how and why craft continues to remain important, vital, and truly relevant in this changing world around us. So all that said, uh, we have a fantastic roster of speakers today, which will be approaching this, these topics from all different angles. And I believe it's going to be a fascinating day. I, I hope that it's going to be an enjoyable one. Um, I think the symposium is running from around 10 o'clock this morning till 6 p.m. And we'll, we'll be giving you uh, breaks during the day, a nice long break for lunch. And there will be a reception following where I think there will be some snacks. So you should be very well taken care of. Um, and uh, finally, please bear with me for just a couple of housekeeping details before I hand over to Nicholas to introduce our first speaker. Um, first, I wanted to mention that although I was not here for the Nation Building Symposium, I just got a chance to preview the catalog that accompanied it that is coming out shortly. It's at the printer right now. Uh, it is a gorgeous book. I think anyone who is interested in the field should own it and have it on their bookshelf. I think it's a limited print run, so um, please check back and uh, keep that in the backs of your heads. Uh, secondly, um, cell phones, as usual. Uh, please silence your cell phones if, uh, now if you have them on. I, I think all of our presenters today are really consummate professionals. It probably will not bother them too much, but it will be embarrassing for you, so we ask that you <laughs> take care of that now. Um, a secondary note along that same line, we are webcasting today, so don't do anything that, uh, that you wouldn't want people to see over and over again on the internet. Just you know, be aware of that. 
um, for, uh, formatting for the day, um, we are planning to move very swiftly through speakers to give them as much time as possible and to leave enough time for questions at the end. So we will not be announcing their full bios as we go through them. Uh, Nicholas and I will simply come up at the beginning of each section and we will introduce the first speaker and that speaker will introduce the next and so on and so forth. Uh, so please also keep your questions to the end. I hope that all of these talks today really uh, incite some interesting questions. And uh, at the end of each section, we will have a microphone uh, available for people in the audience. And please hold your questions until that point. If you have longer discussions, uh, long comments that you want to make, um, please bring them to the reception after the fact. If, if you're too embarrassed to come up and speak, same thing as well. It will be um, you know, a nice venue for that. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, I would like to thank our sponsors for this event. Uh, this event is being sponsored by the Smithsonian Women's Committee and the James Renwick Alliance, uh, without whom we could not do events like this. So I'd like to thank both of them very much for their continuing support. And now, without further ado, I will pass it over to Nicholas Bell, who will introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Nora. And, uh for many of you, for many in the audience who know Nora and have met her over the last year, I think we can all say we're absolutely thrilled that you've come here all the way from Seattle, and we hope you'll stay forever. <laughs> Which is how long people stay at the Smithsonian, usually. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name's Nicholas Bell. I'm senior curator at uh, the Renwick. And while we were closing the Renwick and, and beginning to have this conversation about uh, how do we reopen, what, do we, what is a craft museum, what do we want it to be about, um, I actually dropped my first email to Christopher Frayling, who was our keynote today, and said, I hope that we can have a, at least a private conversation about uh, why and what craft museums are. And so I'm actually delighted that uh, he's flown all the way from London to have that conversation in public instead. Sir Frayling was appointed in 1979 as the first professor of cultural history at the Royal College of Art in London. And befitting that pioneering role, his tastes are famously or I would say infamously Catholic, and range across a number of subjects and platforms. His books run from his first, or his early vampires, Lord Byron to Count Dracula, to last year's The Yellow Peril, Dr. Fu Manchu, and the Rise of Chinophobia, and from a study of the film production designer Ken Adam, who designed the first seven James Bond films, to an acclaimed biography of Sergio Leone, Something to Do with Death. Sir Frayling has also hosted a number of television series, including The Face of Tutankhamun, Strange Landscape on the Middle Ages, Nightmare, The Birth of Horror, and The Art of Persuasion on the History of Advertising, a track record that has rightfully earned him the nickname The Kenneth Clark of Popular Culture. While regaling us with these histories, Sir Frayling has also racked up a very impressive administrative career, first serving as Rector of the Royal College of Art for 13 years, and simultaneously as Chairman of the Arts Council England for five years, he has also served as a governor of the British Film Institute, as chairman of the Royal Mint Advisory Committee, as chairman of the Design Council, and as a trustee of the Victoria and Albert Museum. And he also currently serves as chancellor of the Arts University Bournemouth. Sir Frayling was knighted in 2001 for, quote, services to art and design education, for which he selected the Latin motto, and pardon me for butchering this, but perga scelis mihi diem proficius, I believe. You can correct me on that which roughly translates as, go ahead, punk, make my day. <laughs> None of this quite explains why we have asked Sir Frayling to speak, Sir Frayling to, speak to you today on the subject of craft. A couple of years ago, when I was at the V&A, I was in their shop, and they're one of the only shops that I've ever been to in the world that has an actual bookshelf devoted to craft. It's about this wide. Um, and I knew all of the titles on the shelf. They were all familiar to a lot of people in the audience, except for one, and that was this little pocketbook that I found wedged in between books by people like Glenn Adamson and Ezra Shales. And I, I picked it out of the stacks and took it home and read it on the plane, and it frankly blew my mind. Uh, it's called On Craftsmanship, Towards a New Bauhaus, and it includes eight substantial essays written by Sir Frayling while serving as rector of the RCA. Reading them, I am equally astonished as at the, as at the breadth of his insights on subjects as diverse as George Sturt, John Ruskin, Craft's Role in Industry, uh, and the future of craft education, as I am by his ability to muster the time to think critically about craft amidst his competing roster of responsibilities. So, we are absolutely overjoyed to have you. Please join me in welcoming Sir Christopher Frayling. Uh, 
Thank you very much, and thank you for uh, inviting me to this very important symposium. I always think that the crafts don't have enough debate, critical debate, uh, whilst at the same time remembering the pleasure of making, uh, somehow balancing those two thoughts and uh, reading through the participants today, I, I'm sure that that balance will be retained. Um, I was in a residential care home in the west of Ireland a couple of summers ago, and my, well, my wife's elderly aunt, Eva, uh, kept punctuating what she was trying to say to us with the word craft, and uh, tapping her forehead as she did so, craft. And I thought this must be something to do with the practical activities laid on by the carers at the residential homes. I got quite interested in this, so I said, Eva, which crafts did you have in mind? You know, can you tell me about it? Oh no, she said. It means, can't remember a fecking thing. Uh, I tried to do it in a Galway accent. But it just goes to show how the word crafts uh, and making has become quite a confusing area which can mean almost anything to almost anybody. Uh, the writer David Pye, in a wonderful book called The Nature and Art of Workmanship, uh, actually called craft the word craft, a thought preventer, full of a flock of duck-billed platitudes. Um, and, uh, and I want to talk in this presentation about whether David Pye is right about that, whether um, it, it, it is a thought preventer and is in some ways holding back the discipline, and in what ways he might have been right. Um, as I say, thank you very much for inviting me. I think this is a very urgent and timely debate, the craft, their presentation, their collection, their conservation, and their curation. And the idea of having an opportunity to uh, devote a, a sort of national gallery to the ideals and practice of the craft is such a wonderful opportunity to relate the crafts to modern culture. And it's a huge subject. And what I want to do is to present a series of snapshots, if I might, in the hope of stimulating some thought and critical debate in the course of the day. Because the question of craftsmanship is very much in the ether at the moment, certainly in Europe and I believe in America. Among artists, the importance or not of making and fabricating things oneself, or whether someone else does it for you. Among designers, small scale, well-made, tech shop environments, the maker movement, industries of one as a stimulus and a research to big industry. And among craftspeople, a whole spectrum from the rural crafts at one end, via the arts and crafts movement, to the artist craftsperson, to art at one end of the spectrum and design at the other. So that's a huge series of areas where, which are up for grabs at the moment in debate. And to give an idea of how active and confusing the debate has become, I want to start with the language, snapshot number one. A few years ago, the World Crafts Council suggested a range of categories within the overall concept of the craftsman or the craftsperson. They called it craftsman. Artisan craftsman, one who executes traditional designs or the designs of others. Artist craftsman or designer craftsman, one who is capable of originating his or her own designs and who exhibits and sells them under his or her own name. Designer in the craft field, one who knows the techniques in given media, but prefers to design work for others rather than execute it him or herself. Artisan, artist, designer. And since then, the prefixes artist and designer have at one time or another been added to just about every activity in which the craftsperson engages. Uh, I was in San Francisco a couple of years ago and I went to a shop and it said artist plumbers. <laughs> and there were these taps with strange designs on them and I thought, gosh, I hope they work. <laughs> in Britain, the basic categories appear to have been reduced to artist craftsperson, designer craftsperson, journeyman craftsperson, although David Pye always preferred the word workmanship to craftsmanship. And many resent the connotations of the word journeyman. And of course, there's been an active debate since the 70s about man and person. Recently, there's been a revival of the 19th century categories, decorative artist and applied artist, as a way of sidestepping the problem. And I note that Nicholas is curator of craft and decorative art as a combination, 
and that the catalogue of your collection avoids this completely by being called skilled making, which I think is very clever. But the word crafts itself, with all its historical baggage attached to it, is really being questioned at the moment. In public debates, the arts have tended to become culture, taste has tended to become excellence, and there's been a big shift in public debate from talking about the producers of art to consumers. But the crafts have remained the crafts. In the specialised world of makers and within higher education, there's a Polonius-like array of prefixes and synonyms spearheaded, as I've said, by artist, designer, applied artist, designer, craftspeople, tragical, comical, pastoral, the lot. A sure sign that the root word is now causing embarrassment and not quite doing its job. The common sense folk definition of the word craft seems clear enough. An activity which involves skill in making things by hand derived from the Old English craft, meaning strength or skill. But on closer inspection, the word becomes more and more difficult to pin down, a short word that's been stretched almost to breaking point. Big manufacturers like to promote their wares with the language of craft, handmade, hand-finished, made by our craftsmen, uniquely for you, cousin of the language of organic to reassure anxious customers. And it's interesting that the word craft is usually assumed by advertising people to be associated in the public mind with the values of the past rather than of the present, with pre-digital days which were less anxious. And this at the same time as manuals of business management have been hijacking the language of the modernist avant-garde, usually the Bauhaus, to show how creative and forward-thinking they are. Fitness for purpose, now there's a phrase that's really got into the language. Making form follow function, out of the box. Not to mention any number of palettes, sculptings, broad brushes, frames of reference, patinas, cutting edges, templates, tools, toolboxes, and cutting one's cloth according to, it costs one's coat according to one's cloth. The point is that the language of craft and art is being hijacked by all sorts of other areas and is ripe for reclaiming within the worlds that originated them. To a sociologist, the word craft is always associated with skilled manual labor. To a countryman, with traditional rural pursuits. To a trade unionist, with a community of skilled people defending the way they perform their occupations. To a laboratory scientist, with the use of equipment to do science. And how about the politics of the word? In Germany, during the 1920s and 30s, the culture of craft and of anti-modernism was strongly associated with the political right. In Britain, during the 1880s and 90s, through the writings of William Morris, Walter Crane and disciples, with the political left. Similar repertoire of arguments, radically opposed conclusions. In Germany, this became a popular movement centered on disaffected artisanal businesses. In Britain, it was mainly confined to the artistic realm and was much better tempered, all in the name of craft. To an art critic, the word craft is about the distinction between an art, as in intellectual and conceptual, and mere craft, as in manual, a debased version of age-old debates about the social recognition of the artist, which go back to the Italian Renaissance. A couple of years ago, uh, the Turner Prize winner was a man called Grayson Perry, who's a, a potter artist, who's also a transvestite, and he decided to accept his Turner Prize dressed in a frock, and he said this in his speech, I think the art world had more trouble coming to terms with me being a potter than with my choice of frocks. If you call your pot art, you're being pretentious. If you call your shark art, you're being philosophical. To educationalists, on the other hand, the word is associated with learning by doing, experiential learning, rather than learning from books or from screens. And I'll be coming back to this a little bit later on. To a viewer of mid-evening television, the word craft is to do with watching from a distance as acknowledged experts show what they can do with cookery, gardening, singing, fishing, survivalism, nature watching, interior design, doing up a house. 
while sometimes encouraging less skilled punters to have a go for themselves. Or the word craft is associated with television documentaries about extreme occupations, trawlermen, firefighters, steeplejacks, which are the polar opposite of what most people do in the office watching screens. If you look up the word craft in Brewer's Dictionary of Phrase and Fable, it offers, quote, name given to Freemasonry by its members. In other words, a mysterious form of knowledge, a black box, a usage which seems to date for 1014 BC and the building of Solomon's temple. The word can be a verb or a noun, but the adjective crafty and the adverb craftily, as in deceitful, mean the opposite of the usual definitions of craft. And finally, on this issue of language, if someone were to approach you and ask, what do you make, and you to reply, I make things, and I make them as well as I can, the chances are the questioner would be at a loss for words, because the question, what do you make, is really about how big your bonus is, <laughs> as in, what do you make? At the same time, the word product has moved on from meaning the traditional definition, which hasn't changed yet, a thing assembled or manufactured, to meaning a bundle of services. Uh, the dictionary still says that it's a, a thing manufactured or made, but just walk around and go to a travel agent and see the phrase sun products, meaning a holiday in the sunshine, or insurance products, or even parking products. So the word products is also up for grabs, as well as craft. So it's a very confusing time, and I think one of the themes of our ideal gallery is language. Language matters. And um, I think, you know, the public needs to understand some of these semantic models and how do you find your way through them. I mean, Thomas Kuhn, in his great book on the structure of scientific revolutions, said that such models sometimes precede what he called a paradigm shift. Are we in the process of shifting that word to perhaps maker or skilled worker or workmanship? I don't know. Or should we reclaim the word craft quite aggressively uh, and say, where did it start, where does it finish, and what does it mean to us? So that's snapshot number one. Snapshot number two, which in a way is even broader, is I want you to imagine a lecture I once went to, a brilliant lecture I once went to, by a philosopher called Michael Oakeshott in London, at the London School of Economics. And it was a lecture on what he called uh, tacit knowledge or know-how as distinct between, uh, with formal knowledge. And he stood on the stage and made an omelette. And in, in this hand, he had the recipe. And he read out all the things that the recipe book tells you about an omelette, you know, break three eggs, etc. And in this hand, he had a pan, and he had all the things that the recipe doesn't mention, which are the things you take for granted by living in a culture and just knowing how to do things. For example, you hold the pan by this end, not by that end, otherwise you might get burned. And of course, the amount of tacit knowledge is almost, in principle, infinite. There are so many things that the recipe book doesn't mention. And he finished by saying, this is formal knowledge, this is tacit knowledge, this is craft, this is learning how to live within a culture through experience. And it's an important distinction, both for philosophers and in everyday life. And I think snapshot number two would be some sort of look at what is tacit knowledge and how does it relate to our everyday lives. Because whatever the squabbles about nomenclature, everyone seems to agree that the crafts, if they're about anything, are about tacit knowledge. Being in the zone is today's phrase for it. Another theme for our gallery. Snapshot number three. I don't know if you have this in the United States, but we have in England this phrase, the three R's, relating to uh, education. Oh, one nod, one nod. Very good. Uh, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic. Right? The basis of any, it is said, any well-rounded education. And politicians use this phrase all the time, the three R's, reading, writing, arithmetic, and how they're bedrock of any successful system of secondary education. And it's always worried me, this phrase, because... Basically, reading and writing are the same thing, literacy, and there's numeracy. So really, it's the two R's. Where does the third R come from? 
You've got your arithmetic and you've got your reading and writing. And it's always worried me that it's not really the three R's, it's the two R's. So I did a bit of digging about the origins of the phrase, the three R's. And it all began with a speech given in 1795 by a man called Sir William Curtis, MP for the City of London and Lord Mayor of London, in which he introduced the idea and he explained that the three R's were first of all reading and writing, secondly arithmetic and reckoning, the ability to calculate, and thirdly writing and rorting, W-R-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, or making things, as in wheelwrights, shipwrights, and makers in metal. So reading, rorting, or writing, and arithmetic were the three R's. And those, he said, were the basis of any fully rounded education, literacy, numeracy, and making things. And in fact, there's a carved wooden plaque that someone tipped me off about in an old parish church just south of Exeter in the west of England, a little village called St. Mary's Clist, dating from 1705, even earlier, which has set in a triangle, reading and writing, arithmetic and reckoning, and rorting. Only in the late Victorian era, in the era of hard times and Mr. Gradgrind and the Industrial Revolution, did the three R's turn into reading, writing, and arithmetic. And I think this is an important part of any gallery of the future because it's such a pity that so many schools are downplaying the making side of things these days for all sorts of reasons, including expense, health and safety, and uh, a preference for screens. In fact, you can go through the entire British education system from primary through to university without ever making anything. And there was a conference about this in London uh, last September called Thinking Hands, where interestingly, a whole series of professions came forward, including a neurosurgeon and an airline pilot. And they talked about the importance of hand skills and a knowledge of materials in being able to discern visual details and learning how to read things visually. And the airline pilot rather alarmingly said that uh, most pilots these days are trained entirely on screen, so when it comes to a crisis, they lack that ability to improvise what they have to do in the event of a crisis, which hand skills can actually teach you. I thought, wow. Uh, making, he said, is democratic, playful, and about singularity, about identity. And he finished by saying, play is the highest form of research, which one Albert Einstein said. So snapshot number three would be about reading, rorting, and arithmetic. Snapshot number four, I'm going to get to some pictures in a minute, don't despair. <laughs> um, the Bauhaus, which of course was the basis for art and design education in the West for really half a century, from the 1940s onwards as the ideas of the Bauhaus seeped into general art and design education. And the first manifesto of the Stadtliches Bauhaus, 1919, in Weimar, was written by the architect and educator Walter Gropius, and it's been called the Handicraft Manifesto. And it features on the cover a woodcut of a tall cathedral of the arts by the expressionist artist Lionel Feininger. And it begins with these words, according to almost every translation into the English language. Artists, architects, sculptors, we must all return to the crafts. Artists, architects, sculptors, we must all return to the crafts. An end to art for art's sake. An end to the art that has no living link with the realities of materials. And the unity of all the creative arts within the new architecture. And it's become a catchphrase that says the future lies in returning to the crafts. It is actually a mistranslation and a very important mistranslation, which you've alluded to in your introduction. Because what Gropius really wrote was, we must all turn to the crafts, not return, but turn. Meaning the contemporary crafts, not some romantic, nostalgic vision of what they were once like and how hard they once were. Not a return or even a U-turn, but a straightforward turn. Like a philosophical turn in an argument expressed in visual terms. It was, as Gropius later added during the second phase of the Bauhaus, 
a question of the crafts trying to shed their traditional nature, which was holding them back, and instead becoming research work for industrial production, speculative experiments, part of the experimental workshop, research work for visual production, the laboratory of the mind, a way of embodying the thinking, and the preparatory work of evolving and perfecting new forms. And that's what he meant by the turn to the craft. So I think our fourth snapshot is the difference between a turn to the craft and a return. Number five, the current debate in the literature, which is very much about a turn to the craft rather than a return to the craft. And I, I know this is, uh, this is also quite big in the United States. Professor Matthew Crawford, an American philosopher who also runs a motorcycle repair shop specializing in old European and Japanese models, has recently published, as I'm sure you know, an impassioned and best-selling book, which in England was called The Case for Working with Your Hands, or Why Office Work is Bad. Uh, in the United States, it was called, rather differently, Shop Class as Soul Craft, An Inquiry into the Value of Work, 2009. And it argues for the morality of getting one's hands dirty by actually making or fixing things, an argument which tries hard to, quote, avoid the precious images of manual work that intellectuals sometimes traffic in, unquote. The case relates, I think, to the current recessional economic climate in a similar way to Robert Persig's Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance in the mid-1970s, only with less Plato and more Aristotle this time, and it's made a surprising splash with political and economic analysts in, on the British side of the Atlantic. Are people less likely to throw things away in these recessional times? Has the knowledge economy rhetoric been overdone? What about our frugal future? Have we been too reliant on financial services, Crawford asks. What about the things you can't get on the internet, like hammering a nail or driving a screw? The things that have to be performed in person, the things that can't be flown over for, from China or supplied down the wire. Must it always be, we'll write it, they'll print it? Meanwhile, in England, the philosopher Alain de Botton has assembled a book called The Pleasures and Sorrows of Work, same year, 2009, a collage of examples around the question, when does a job feel meaningful? And New York, as well as London-based sociologist Richard Sennett, in a wonderful book called The Craftsman, 2008, has examined the desire to do a job well for its own sake, from historical, sociological, and philosophical perspectives, as the characteristic that distinguishes us from other life forms, the desire to do a job well for its own sake. And he's convinced that that desire resides in all of us. So craftsmanship is definitely being debated, actually more than ever, I think, at the moment, as an idea ripe to be reclaimed and re-evaluated, an idea that should shed its long-standing uh, tendency to speak its name with an upward cadence, with a kind of cultural cringe about it. And I think the moment has come to drop that, because the mantra today is, let's hear it for making things as best we can. Snapshot number six, obviously a history of the crafts in the last 150 years or so. Uh, and I'm using lots of British examples, but I do hope that they relate to the United States in various ways. I'm sure, in fact, I'm sure they do. So I'm going to do a bit of a broad brush history, because out of this must also come what our new craft museum must deal with it. And we're going to have some pictures at last. The story begins, I suppose, where modern craft is concerned, with the arts and crafts movement of the late 19th century, roughly contemporaneous with uh, the original uh, design and building of the Renwick Gallery, which made the crafts visible and gave them a value for the first time. Up to the mid 18th century, they were just the way that things were made and valued as such and could never be discussed as a separate concept. Look at the 18th century encyclopedia in France where the crafts are simply treated as that's how things are made, not as a separate concept. In the late 19th century, they were no longer the way things were predominantly made, and the arts and crafts movement only made sense 
in relation to mass manufacture are actually, more characteristically, steam power hand finishing. As criticism, as exemplar, as alternative, as well-made rather than shoddily made. And this movement and its accompanying theories by Ruskin and William Morris and others and their equivalents in the United States had all sorts of global connections as well with folk traditions, with what they called Eastern religions, with literary myth cycles, and so on. It was, in fact, Ethel Mere, a disciple of William Morris, who first showed Mahatma Gandhi how to weave on a hand loom, a direct connection between Indian nationalism and the arts and crafts movement. And the potter Bernard Leach, lots of connections with Korea and Japan. Michael Cardew, lots of connections with Africa. And we may disapprove of some of the ways in which those cultures were used, but there was an attempt to explore kindred spirits overseas. The legacy of this movement was a popular image of the crafts, which survived right through, in England anyway, to the 1960s, and in some places still does. If you'd asked a purchaser or an exhibitor or a curator or an exhibition goer or even a maker about the crafts up till the mid-60s, uh, at that time the following list would have emerged. Crafts must be made of natural materials, preferably in beige. <laughs> crafts must be functional. Crafts must be the work of one person, perhaps featuring visible thumbprints to prove it. Crafts must be the embodiment of a traditional design. Crafts must be in the artisan rather than the fine art tradition. Crafts must be, in some ways, rural products. Crafts must be untouched by fashion, which it was assumed meant badly made fashion. Crafts must be easily understood. Crafts must last like a brogue shoe or a fine tweed. Crafts must be affordable, even if, like William Morris's work, affordable only by Oxbridge colleges, Anglican churches, and collectors, but nevertheless, a sense of affordable. But above all, above all, the crafts must provide a solace in a rapidly changing world, a residue of their ritual function, making you feel better about change. And a wonderful example of that tradition, I, I once experienced the, a man called Edward Barnsley, who died in 1987, was a direct link to William Morris's world. He was a furniture maker in the Cotswolds in England uh, via Sidney Barnsley and Ernest Jimson, furniture makers within a sort of vernacular craft tradition. And shortly before he died in 87, he was scheduled to speak about his workshop and working in wood and the value of the arts and crafts philosophy today. But Edward Barnsley suffered a relapse during the lecture and all he could do was repeat over and over again a poem that he'd learned as a child. And it was the most extraordinary moment because in the end he had to be told to stop and leave, etc. And the poem was D.H. Lawrence's poem, Things Men Have Made. And I just want to read it to you because for me this summarizes the arts and crafts philosophy. It really was the most extraordinary evening. Things men have made with wakened hands and put soft life into are awake through years with transferred touch and go on glowing for long years. And for this reason, some old things are lovely, warm still with the life of the forgotten men who made them. Whatever man makes and makes it live, lives because of the life put into it. A yard of India muslin is alive with Hindu life. And a Navajo woman, weaving her rug in the pattern of her dream, must run the pattern out in a little break at the end so that her soul can come out back to her. But in the odd pattern, like snake marks on the sand, it leaves its trail. And Barnsley just said, it was extraordinary, said these words over and over and over again. Um, and for him, he said, this was a summation of the arts and crafts philosophy. So first slide. Um, uh, there's recently a, a big exhibition in London at the National Portrait Gallery on William Morris and his legacy. Um, the, uh, uh, curated by Fiona MacArthur, who is uh, Morris's biographer. And it got me thinking about what that tradition means today. This is obviously Morris. Uh, the first is that they were unashamed of writing about it. 
Uh, this is Walter Crane, uh, 1892, the basis of design. In fact, Crane became uh, my predecessor as rector of the Royal College of Art, and his lectures, uh, he was theorizing the crafts as he went along, even in a fairly atheoretical atmosphere. Uh, this is uh, Crane's Dado of 1875, Rush and Iris. You know these, I'm sure. William de Morgan, 1890, a luster wear charger. A chintz, Tulip and Willow by Morris. So Morris obviously is the heart of this movement uh, and Walter Crane um, joins it late, brings in education. And I want to do a little sort of uh, digression here because what people I don't think realize is what education system the arts and crafts people were reacting against. They were reacting against a particular way of teaching design which uh, was very strong in, in England but also was exported uh, to the United States in the 1860s and usually was associated with institutions located within museums. Design was a kind of language. You learnt the language uh, from texts like The Grammar of Ornament by Owen Jones and you learned to conjugate the visual language by copying uh, as many details. This is uh, the, the, the tops of pillars in Egypt. And you'd simply week by week copy these one by one so that you left with a visual lexicon in your head which it was thought you could then apply to anything that came your way. It was, here they are all copying away, extraordinary staff-student ratio. <laughs> One member of staff and all those students copying away all the objects. And I often used to remind the V&A that um, it actually started life as the visual aids department of the Royal College of Art um, until they ran out of space and had to found a museum <laughs> to look after all these things that they were copying. Um, not just copying objects, but the language of nature, the evolution of designs and the evolution of nature. These are some drawings by Christopher Dresser, the industrial designer, which were used in that system. Conjugating a language of function. How, how do teapots pour? How do jugs pour? The principles of decorative design. And because it was a period of high Victorian certainty, you had examples of bad design and examples of good design. And this was bad design. Bad design, direct imitation of, it's even got one of, a little bit of the label left on it, it's in the V&A. I managed to track down, uh, there was a big exhibition in uh, the mid 1850s called the Chamber of Horrors in London, which was all uh, uh, about 70 examples of bad design. And it was hugely popular. Uh, uh, Dickens wrote a wonderful parody of it where a man comes in from East London and visits the exhibition and discovers everything, every single exhibit is in his living room. And he, he can't enjoy life anymore. Uh, and he tries to console himself with a cup of tea and sees there's a butterfly painted in the bottom of his cup, which is another cardinal sin. Uh, so he can't even enjoy a cup of tea anymore. Anyway, uh, um, bad design, direct imitation of nature, doesn't repeat very well busy wallpaper, trying to imitate nature rather than turn it into some sort of formulaic design. Uh, bad design, uh, uh, great exhibition, souvenir wallpaper. Not least because there isn't a pond in front of him with, with these boats on it. And all these architectural details, again, uh, uh, as a repeat, uh, as wallpaper, it's, uh, it's pretty busy. Uh, bad design, um, a, a light fitment that's in the shape of a convolvulus plant. Uh, light fitments, uh, said uh, the educators, should look like light fitments. They shouldn't look like convolvuli. Uh, this is in breach of virtually uh, all the tenets of Victorian taste. Interestingly, this is good design. And you might say, well, I'm not quite sure of the, of the difference. But this is a, a water carafe. And because they're reeds, and they're done in this slightly geometric way, reeds, water, it was thought to be appropriate. So this is good design. Um, you also had, um, uh, I couldn't resist these two actually, because uh, uh, I found this in the v and the um, uh, copying uh, 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 casts of antique sculptures and the, the cast court at the v and which was the heart of the students of this system of uh, education, has recently been refurbished. And here's Michelangelo's David, and you'll notice that he's wearing a fig leaf. Uh, which was for the ladies' drawing class, uh, and also in case a member of the royal family looked in and might be a bit offended. And I've actually found the fig leaf, which I'm quite pleased with. You can be certain that museums never throw anything away. Um, so um, in reaction against that system of education, um, 
which uh, a member of the arts, uh, arts and crafts movement called Cast Rated, which I rather like, because you're copying plaster casts all the time and never quite allowing yourself to let rip. This was the new orthodoxy. This is uh, a student exhibition of 1911 based on arts and crafts philosophies of education, where making becomes important and you specialize in one craft. And what's so interesting about this, of course, by today's standards, is how monocultural, it's nearly all Christian, uh, church plate, um, and in the case of um, what we call today graphic design, uh, these particular examples from all over the country of uh, book design. So the arts and crafts movement, no longer dictionaries, no longer learning a language, but making, understanding materials, and learning a craft. But it rapidly became as orthodox and traditional as the system which it was replacing. Lewis Day, Bellows, he was a great teacher in this system, a disciple of Morris, that's from the V&A. Um, and Edward Johnston, the calligrapher, taught um, typography and, um, and, and calligraphy. And it's interesting, because you think, well, these arts and crafts people were very remote from everyday life, but in his spare time, he designed the underground sign, Edward Johnston. He said, it's my concession to the world of mammon. <laughs> Uh, and this iconic uh, image, uh, which I don't think it's uh, un unfair to call iconic, um, bottom left, which is uh, the, the, the great underground sign, was Edward Johnston on his day off when he wasn't telling them about Trajan's column. The other thing that this world brought with it was an alternative lifestyle. And I think this is important for exhibitions on this era. This is Sylvia Pankhurst, um, very much involved in the suffragist movement. Um, who was a student within the arts and crafts philosophy and did a series of self-portraits. And uh, again, in her spare time, she designed the graphic design for the suffragette movement, uh, the only student of the era to spend her summer holidays on hunger strike in a uh, woman's prison. And she graduated with a series of paintings of women's work all over the country. This is a Leicester boot factory. So it was associated not just with making, but also with a certain alternative lifestyle, a certain radicalism, which I mentioned earlier, uh, politically as well. This was one of her designs. The other thing that the arts and crafts emphasized was the, um, the importance of traditional rural crafts, which, of course, hadn't really been of concern to the earlier educators at all. And there's the cult, I don't know if you get this in the States, the cult of the Windsor chair. This is uh, the wood bodgers in the forests of Buckinghamshire, High Wycombe, uh, making these uh, you know, fixed, solid seat, bent wood back, very plentiful beech wood. And people would set up um, temporary sort of tent-like um, uh, accommodation and bodge, in other words, take, glean the wood, the beech wood, and it became a centre for the manufacture of Windsor chairs. There's a huge cult of the Windsor chair at this time. And a lot of companies like G-Plan and Urkel moved to High Wycombe as a result of it. Now, if one was thinking of exhibitions about that era, um, there's, there was an exhibition um, a little while ago in, in England, it's called Three by One. And what it tried to do was look at what happened to that arts and crafts tradition in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, and uh, it's quite interesting, really, to look at the next generation and what they did, rather than treat it as a Victorian phenomenon. This is two uh, textile designers called Baron and Larcher. Um, this is a, a design called Diagonal, on the left, linen, and on the right, uh, Indian cotton. And um, in the Craft Study Centre in England, all their pattern books have survived. And it, it's taking the arts and crafts movement into the early era of modernism. And the other thing the exhibition was about, which I thought was very interesting, was looking at the reference materials that a lot of these latter-day arts and crafts people used. These are pots related to Bernard Leach and Michael Cardew, uh, pots from Japan, from Korea, old English pots. And uh, they bequeathed their collections to the Craft Study Centre. And I thought, that's an interesting series of exhibitions. The reference, what excited these people? What were their historical references? And how can one actually turn those into exhibitions, or I mentioned Ethel Mare earlier, the weaver who taught Gandhi. Well, this was her reference material of felts and braids from India and the former Yugoslavia. So one can take that tradition a little bit further. But in the 70s, the crafts, like everything else, changed and evolved, 
And definitions of skill as something static or of the crafts as confined to a particular approach or medium were up for grabs. Graduates from art schools were more likely to set up a studio or to work by themselves as studio craftspeople than to engage directly with industry. They wanted to sign their work. And in Britain in the late 70s, there was a survey of 20,000 working craftspeople at this time called Working in Crafts, sponsored by the new British Crafts Council. And it concluded that the attractions were A, the way of life, B, control at the point of production, C, the joy of making, and D, the average disposable income of these 20,000 working craftspeople was £4,500 a year. In other words, they were prepared completely to sacrifice any kind of quality of life for this one thing that they absolutely adored to do. Ethics weren't top of the agenda for them. Uh, they felt that the ethical dimension of the crafts was in some way holding them back. And I remember there was an exhibition at the V&A called The Craftsman's Art in 1973, which related to American developments in the 60s, Vulkos and others. Um, and at the opening, someone looked at a photograph of William Morris, and I overheard him say, William Morris, wasn't he that silly old bugger with muesli in his beard? Something had changed in the attitude towards the arts and crafts movement. And if you'd asked an exhibition goer in the late 70s, the list would look like this. Crafts can be made with machines and even by them if numerically controlled technology goes on improving. Crafts can be made with synthetic materials in all colors of the rainbow. Crafts can be non-functional and may even conform to the American Customs and Border Control Agency definition of a work of art that it must be totally useless. <laughs> crafts can be made in limited production. Crafts can be designed by one person and made by another, which in fact they were in the original arts and crafts movement. Crafts can provide designed prototypes for industry. Crafts can be made in towns, and in fact they usually are. Crafts can be high fashion and still be well made, although they needn't be. Crafts can use ideas borrowed from the fine arts of painting and sculpture. Crafts can be transient and they can be lasting. It's up to them. Crafts can be very expensive indeed. Uh, again, like William Morris's work. Above all, the role of the craft is no longer to provide a solace, it's to provide a challenge often by means of an ironic statement about traditional notions of the crafts, an intellectual as well as a visual challenge. And so a whole series of exhibitions about feminism and the crafts, about uh, the domestic sphere, about taking the domestic sphere more seriously, um, etc., and about what I like to call the Cinderella complex of the crafts, that everyone wanted to go to the ball, um, uh, and uh, again, a quote, uh, someone wrote about an exhibition in the heart of this revolution and said, it's all very well to have an avant-garde in the crafts, but wouldn't it be nice to have a well-designed fire guard as well? So here's some images from the British end. of the, This is the Windsor chair, traditionally. That's a very traditional version of it in the 19th century. Uh, Richard Bateman, a riff on the concept of Windsor chair, 1970s. Taking it even further in the 1980s. Meanwhile, manufacturers of furniture use the image of the Windsor chair to market their mass manufactured products. So you get pictures of the wood bodgers in brochures about industrial furniture. So what you're getting is the crafts as a nostalgic form of advertising. Uh, Richard Bateman again. Um, black and white chairs in oak. Or taking the traditional language of craft and design and doing something with it. This is Robert Dawson taking willow pattern and deconstructing it and uh, turning it into all sorts of images on Bone China, 1994. This was one of my favorites. It was a student of mine in the early 2000s who animated William Morris note, uh, wallpaper. And uh, I, was, I thought I was going mad, actually. I was looking at this uh, rather wonderful. Uh, sorry, the picture's a bit fuzzy, but it's from an animation. And a mouse suddenly appeared and walked along the branch and looked at me. 
and, and, and then it got a nut and dropped it. And I thought, God, this is, this is very, very strange. Even weirder that a lot of doctors in our National Health Service actually commissioned him <laughs> to produce these animations for their waiting rooms. And I sort of felt, well, if you're not feeling strange before you arrive, you certainly are by the time it's your turn. Anyway, Fred Bayer. Uh, tartan chair of the 1980s. What I love about this is it breaks every rule of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, okay, tartan is a traditional idea, but it makes wood do all sorts of things that Morris would have thought was screaming at them, and, and in lots of day glow colors, tartan chair. Uh, the Azumis, uh, this is um, furniture for an urban nomad, someone living in a tiny apartment, if they're lucky, or maybe a room, and it's a table and a chest of drawers. It sort of folds down. The crafts and modern urban living. Uh, Liz Fritsch ceramics, the polar opposite of Leach, in that they work beautifully from the side if you photograph them. They look like the colours of a Renaissance painting, but if you turn them this way, they just have a strip of ceramic. It's like ceramic as canvas. It just is not what the, that tradition of the arts and crafts thought. Or within craft departments, taking... Uh, this is pushing the edges a bit, but this is... Um, uh, with the arrival of cell phones uh, and the effect it had on public behaviour, uh, some craft departments at, at the Royal College started working on conceptual statements about that kind of technology. This is uh, a cell phone where the numbers are on the fingers and the thing you speak. So you have to, like Jane Austen, you have to put your hand over your mouth when you're talking. Uh, it was a statement. Or this, which uh, was a statement about mobile technology by a group of craft students on the left. It's a series of mouse traps. And on the left, the assumption that it's a Christian mouse. Uh, the, the second one along, uh, you can't quite see it, but it's a weighing machine. And if the mouse is overweight, it gets it, you know. Uh, it's a moral statement. On the right, the mouse has a choice. It can go to the right. Uh, but the final one, and it gives the date, uh, you can tell by the mobile uh, wand there, it contacts you on your cell phone and asks you, what, what do you want, you know? Will it be like sort of Nero, you know, will it, um, et cetera. But it was a kind of riff on uh, uh, the way technology was going, only expressing it. Conceptual crafts, conceptual crafts. Um, or, or Daniel Viles' homage to Marcel Duchamp, which was a radio uh, inside a bag, and it was trying to say, design is part of culture, the crafts are part of culture, don't separate them. Uh, we can make the edges between art and craft uh, quite fuzzy if we want to. So what if one was going to compile such a list for today? Well, in some ways, as we've heard, it would look like the 1970s list, and a lot of those issues are still working their way through the system. Uh, the interface between the arts and the crafts has become a fascinating one, particularly with the fall of conceptual art. I mean, people predicted, there was a famous essay in, in Britain by a man called Misha Black, that conceptual art would lead to a huge revival of the crafts because people would want things that they could take home. And the, the, the conceptual art which pitched itself towards the galleries or became instant performance art, live art, was, was something you can't take home, as it were, and there'd be this, sh this shift of interest into the crafts. It never quite happened, but with the, the fall of conceptual art, um, the questions are being asked of that kind again. But I think today's list would also have just as much to do with design. There was a very interesting exhibition at the Crafts Council in England called Industry of One, which had uh, characters like Ron Arad, uh, Jasper Morrison, Ross Lovegrove. Arad, I think you'll have heard of, he had an exhibition at... Uh, uh, MoMA in New York, um, and it was all about how one-offs with numerically controlled technology can turn into batches, and that the crafts were knocking on the door of industry and trying to get in. Um, a generation educated either as craftspeople or industrial designers making batches or one-offs, um, and there was a lot of talk about that. And, of course, about the relationship between the crafts and digital technology. I mentioned David Pye at the beginning with his book, The Nature and Art of Workmanship, and I remember he gave a lecture about his furniture once where he had a bowl, a cherry wood bowl, which had been made with what he called his fluting engine, beautiful grooves, and it was really a lovely piece, and he handed it around and talked all about the craftsmanship. 
And then at the, as it had gone round the lecture theatre, he said, actually, that was made by a piece of numerically controlled technology, and I can do an infinite number. And everyone who'd looked at it and said, isn't that beautiful, suddenly said, oh, Lord, it's horrible. <laughs> and he was trying to say, well, let's have a debate about that, you know, uh, that does the way in which something is fabricated actually matter if you're going to respond to the final object like that. So there was a big debate, a big debate about that. Um, the, um, another exhibition I want to take you to briefly um, was an exhibition that took place in the Ruffin Gallery in Wales. It was called The Age of Experience. And what it tried to do was to say, yes, all these youngsters are knocking on the door with these ideas of those definitions of craftsmanship that I mentioned. But what happened to the 1960s and 70s generation who um, were kept at it and, what, and, and, and sort of matured within a slightly different aesthetic? It says, the rich creative practice that can only result from a lifetime of commitment, research, commissioning, and experimentation. So side by side with the contemporary sort of avant-garde generation, what about uh, this generation? And I, I wrote the catalog for that exhibition and I wrote this. What distinguishes them, makes them highly visible, is the care with which they've been made, the fact they've been made by one human being for another, the individual take, the use of materials, and the thoughtfulness of their design, design with attitude. They can represent an ethical statement, but they needn't. Uh, the crafts have definitively joined the lifestyle pages of magazines and newspapers, and sometimes even makeover programs on television. And critics have started writing about how the crafts, with their aesthetic added value, have moved beyond traditional forms of tacit knowledge to playing a much fuller part in the wider culture and society. But these are now seen as a range of possibilities rather than inhibitors. The crafts have become a spectrum, and the more inclusive and varied and versatile, the better. It's become more than ever uh, to draw attention to this at a time when crafts and materials-based courses in colleges and universities are seen as too heavy on resources, while screens and digital technologies are the flavor of the month. Here's my statistic of the day, ladies and gentlemen. 42% of all craft courses in the United Kingdom in higher education have closed since 2007. Actually, there are fascinating and important crossovers to be explored between the crafts and digital technologies, a way of reuniting the crafts with manufacturing and with industries of one, where they also touch the design world. So here's some slides of the age of experience. Um, this was a, a bridge by... Richard Bateman, the man who did that wacky Windsor chair from the age of experience, installation shot. So the other tradition, I mean, you know, you could say it's all avant-garde, but it isn't. There's this other tradition that's going on side by side with it of more mature craftspeople. Liz Fritch today. Um, Sven Bayer, he's a potter. Um, Wally Keeler. Wally Keeler, wrought iron teapot, detail. Or within textiles, Mary Restio. This is iCat weaving. Uh, very much within a tradition, but trying to jazz it up a bit. And Peter Collingwood, wall hangings. These are all from the age of experience as an exhibition. David Drew baskets. Details, um, Richard Bateman, Bridge. Caroline Broadhead, a jeweler who now does floor pieces. Uh, detail. Um, Michael Rowe. Michael Rowe is a very interesting artist. Uh, this is called uh, Pre-Genus Number 2, Silver, Brass, and Aluminium. And he was the first craftsperson in the UK to do a doctorate from within making. Um, and he did it with the rather unappetizing title, The Colorization and Patination of Metals. <laughs> you know, they're not going to make a movie of it with that title, but anyway. Um, but he, um, uh, what was interesting was he produced, he wanted to work out how you get color effects on metal and what chemical processes are involved. So he partnered with a scientist. And half his PhD was a presentation of all these different color effects on metal. And the other half was a beautiful exhibition of objects made using those techniques. 
And it really was uh, extremely interesting, research through craft rather than research into craft by Michael Rowe, but there's been many since. It's a coming area. Using craft as a means of answering questions uh, rather than as an end in itself, or as well as an end in itself. Michael Rowe again, and David Watkins, the jeweler, who started life designing models for the film 2001, A Space Odyssey in the 60s, and uh, has become a well-known jeweler. The, so they're all from the age of experience. My final snapshot, number seven, is trying to flip this whole subject and to imagine an exhibition about the position and status of the crafts within fine art today. In the David Hockney landscape exhibition called A Bigger Picture at London's Royal Academy a couple of years ago, there was a caption which attracted an unusual amount of attention. Because amidst the many oil paintings, watercolours, drawings, films and iPad sketches, it simply said, all the works were made by the artist himself, personally. And Hockney himself said in an interview, rather defensively, because there was a huge hoo-ha, they thought he was getting at Damien Hirst. <laughs> um, and the Royal Academy had to issue a press release. Contrary to recent reports, David Hockney, RA, has not made any comments which imply criticisms of another artist's work practices. <laughs> so Hockney himself, in an interview, rather defensively said, uh, this wasn't intended as a reference to anybody else, uh, that the statement was actually a joke, and that, but it did have a serious point behind it. He said, in art education, they used to teach the craft and left the poetry up to the individual, whereas today, they teach the poetry and completely ignore the craft. And this has left young artists without the technical skills to express their own ideas. How can a student master the language of painting, if paint is the chosen medium, unless he, she understands the grammar? The visual arts, Hockney implied, were unique in this respect. Deep learning was still at the root of an education in music, composition, dance, drama, and singing, but not in the visual arts. And this debate, which was much more than a spat between two celebrity artists, followed hot on the heels of a series of fascinating London exhibitions in autumn 2011, which raised similar questions. I mentioned Grayson Perry winning the Turner Prize and wearing a frock. Well, he curated an exhibition at the British Museum called The Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman, 2012, which interspersed artifacts from the museum's collection with Grayson Perry's pots, and concluded with the thought that even today, quote, it is important to have a long and sympathetic hands-on relationship with materials, a relaxed, humble, ever-curious love of stuff. And a critic called Brian Sewell, who's rather an outspoken critic in the UK, interpreted this in characteristically robust terms as a polemic about the old distinction between an art and a craft. And he wrote, pottery is only pottery the craftsman's stuff of the kitchen and the cabinet of curiosities, never to be mistaken for a work of art. One might well preserve pickled herrings in a peri pot, drown a Duke of Clarence in it, or even pee in it, none of which things can be done with Michelangelo's David. The simplest way to distinguish between an art and a craft, he concluded, was to ask if the artifact had a use or not. Actually, Grayson Perry wasn't talking about that at all. He was on a completely different tack, and a much more significant one. The Tomb of the Unknown Craftsman was a plea to stop and take a closer look at all those anonymous objects, shrines, relics, tapestries, maps, pilgrimage souvenirs, sacred sculptures, which belong to a more spiritual age. And it was also about a related theme, how art galleries and museums have become the new sacred spaces, where people behave in silent reverential ways and where original exhibits in their glass cases have taken on a secular kind of aura. Increasingly, this encourages the spectacular rather than the humble. It also leads to the ubiquitous use of the word iconic. But above all, the unknown craftsman was a sustained response to the fashionable thesis distilled in another book by a man called Michael Petrie called The Art of Not Making, The New Artist-Artisan Relationship that since the days of Marcel Duchamp, roughly from 1917 onwards, serious avant-garde art, said this book, has utterly separated itself from its fabrication. 
Art is named as art. It's art if I say it's art. And someone else who's expert at that sort of thing makes it become real. The role of the artist is to think, to conceive ideas, and to delegate the making to artisans who remain anonymous. Hence the phrase conceptual art. And so this book, The Art of Not Making, was one of the things that Grayson Perry was having a crack at. He said, it's not at all the same thing as the division of labor in a Renaissance workshop at the dawn of the art-craft relationship because the artist in the Renaissance created the overall design, employed assistants to paint some of the details, then completed the work of art himself. The workshop was a communal space and the artist led from the front. Not the same because post Duchamp, the think work and the do work have become completely separated and the artist simply does not possess anything like the skills of his, her assistants. And this is the new artist-artisan relationship. So it's a really interesting exhibition raising that issue of what about making in contemporary art? And that, I think, is a good subject. At the same time, the v &A Museum hosted an exhibition called The Power of Making, The Importance of Being Skilled, um, a hugely successful exhibition. And its title was a deliberate reply to Petrie's book, which looked at how once the processes of making have shed their nostalgic and sentimental associations, and once the long shadows of the arts and crafts movement and of the hard-won image have been exorcised, they will have a strong relevance in the post-industrial world at a time when fewer people know how to make things, the things they use, than ever before in history. 315,000 people visited this show, which up until recently made it the second most successful show in the V&A's history. It was a small show. The most successful was Art Deco, by the way. <laughs> um, it's just been overtaken by David Bowie, but we won't talk about that. Um, to put over this point, the exhibition included, uh, on the left there, a gorilla made out of metal coat hangers, videos about the thrill of feeling in the zone by doing something really well, a polyester and fiberglass chair by Ron Arad, uh, Tom Heatherwick, uh, a well-known designer at the moment, um, uh, exploring the borderlands between concept and realization through furniture. And here's a quote of the essay I did for the catalogue. Um, it aims to encourage debate on the nature and importance of making. Despite all the value that exists in making, fewer and fewer people know how to make things, the things they use, need, or want, or even how these things are made. And this is one of the unfortunate legacies of the industrial revolutions that have shaped the world we live in. The distance between the maker and the user is growing, and with it, knowledge, understanding, and appreciation are diminishing. This is true in all walks of life, and increasingly in many professional disciplines. Distance and lack of understanding are impacting also on governments and educational institutions, which are failing to see that making is very much part of the future, that the power of making lies far beyond providing technical support to those who manage. Nor is making the exclusive domain of the creative arts. Applied thinking lies at the core of creating new knowledge of all kinds. If it is not, it will lead to a great loss in value. Art should not be separated from science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And finally, in all cases of making, be it whittling a bow to make a fire, shaping a piece of timber to be cut by a computerized milling machine, carving a wooden last or splitting leather to make a shoe, molding a prosthetic eye to fit its socket, inventing a new way to manipulate metal tubes to describe a figurative form, knitting lace underwear or stitching sequins onto a religious flag, or even programming a 3D printer to replicate itself, there are always two aspects that come into play. How can it be made and how good are you at it? The first is a question about technique, the second a matter of personal skill. And these two aspects of power are what the exhibition is about. It includes many curious objects which were selected to demonstrate human achievement in three areas, in developing extraordinary methods for making, in acquiring spectacular personal skills, and in devising ingenious experiments. I just want to show you some slides from The Power of Making, because again, I think this is a really interesting area for exhibiting, where you take it beyond the traditional media and thoughts about the craft into all sorts of 
ancillary areas. This is an establishing shot. Hugely successful with uh, young people, this exhibition. This is the gorilla made out of metal coat hangers by David Mack, 2011. Installations about the zone. Ron Arad's chair, polyester gel, and fiberglass. A bicycle. But also, there was a dry stone wall raising the issue of if you can't make something arty, is it still a craft? <laughs> you can't really do an arty, well, you can do an arty dry stone wall, but it's supposed to keep the water out. Uh, and the sheep, but they had a dry stone wall, a saddle, shotguns, a dress made out of discarded audio tapes, a camera, which had been entirely made at home, satellites, a guitar, some jam, <laughs> some clothing, a prototype spacesuit, and interestingly, all these ceramic models of cars, because they still, when engaging in automotive design, use uh, the craft of uh, ceramic to test in wind tunnels and so on. There seems to be no better way of doing it, even in the computer age. Knitting, jewellery, and then some installations about the mashup, tinker labs, thinking and do labs, etc. So, the, what's the conclusion to all this? Uh, this is an exhibition by Thomas Heatherwick called Brand.new. It's about uh, the brandscape. The, the world that the young craftsperson is going to have to inhabit and navigate their way through. The debate about artist and artisan, concept and fabrication, poetry and craft, usage and grammar, has been around in one form or another for a very long time. In its current incarnation, it dates back to the late 1910s. Those who argue for the importance of technical skills in education and professional practice are routinely accused of coming over all conservative, the sorts of commentators who think any avant-garde practice since Duchamp is part of the shock of the new. I mean, in two years' time, 2017, the urinal will be celebrating its centenary. And yet, when there are major exhibitions raising precisely these questions at the Royal Academy, the British Museum, and the V&A simultaneously, all in the same season, and when leading philosophers and sociologists start writing about the craftsman and the case for working with your hands, the question has certainly re-entered the ether. It's alive and well and being posed with increasing urgency. There seems to be an unease about the new division of mental and manual labor and a desire not to be categorized as a fuddy-duddy conservative for expressing it. Maybe we need a new vocabulary and contemporary ways of expressing what are genuine anxieties and speculations about what the next chapter might be. And in conclusion, uh, you were kind enough, Nicholas, to mention this little book on craftsmanship. And I finish by saying why such a debate about craftsmanship is more important than ever. What are the reasons? They are called flexible working, portfolio careers, multitasking, short-termism, quick-fix training, suspicion of expertise, confusion between elites and elitism, the downgrading of dedication, quantitative targets and tick boxing, the value attached to presentation skills, outsourcing offshore, we'll write it, they'll print it, casino capitalism, the look at me culture, 15 minutes of fame, branding, one size fits all, the remote society and the rapidity of technological change. Thank you very much.